My name is Jim Hefner. I'm a physical therapist in Boulder, Colorado, and a patient of venous thoracic outlet syndrome. In 2011, I had a first rib resection and an anterior and middle scalenectomy where they removed my anterior and middle scalene. And in this video, I wanna share with you the top lessons I've learned as a physical therapist and as a patient, um, having been out of TOS surgery about 13 years now. Lesson number one, rehab will take longer than you think it will. And I don't want you to, that to scare you, but in my opinion and from my own experiences, that's the reality. And the reason is, is when they do a first rib resection, they are working very close to your brachial plexus, which pr provides muscle activation and innervation to all the entire upper extremity. Uh, there's muscles that attach onto the first rib. So with me, they took out the anterior middle scalene. The first rib also has close connection to the collarbone. So if you look at me in standing, my right, or in sitting here, my right shoulder is naturally an inch or two lower now. And that's because the first rib provides a supporting role to the structure and function of the upper extremity. These were things that I didn't really think about or I didn't really know. I was just in my first semester of PT school when I had had this about 13 years ago. So the rehab process is gonna take longer than you think because of the anatomical complexity of the area. In my case specifically, during surgery, they clipped the nerve to this pec muscle. So my pec for the first, first six months or eight months had no innervation and it gradually atrophied. And then at some point through, through my practice and repetition, that muscle started coming back, but it took a while for that muscle to regenerate. Also for me, I had a, a vein graft, which means they took a cadaveric vein and they tried to replace my subclavian vein because I had venous thoracic outlet syndrome. And with that process, my arm still had some residual swelling afterwards, especially exercise-induced swelling. And the process for the collateral circulation or my what I think about as the, sm the main highway closed down so the smaller roads all had to get stronger and become much more robust. That process took a lot longer than I thought it would. Now, it didn't demoralize me. I, I just had to take a step back from what my expectations were. So in the first several months, it was a lot of scapular strengthening position type of movements of the shoulder, making sure that my shoulder was kind of strong and my rotator cuff was strong through all of these different ranges of motion. So that was the first step, then gradual strength training and loading, and then getting back to things like running, which you don't think about, but are kind of a jostling movement of the shoulder, bringing back stability to that area, especially since the anatomy had changed, was a big shift from what I had expected where I kind of thought I was gonna be back to quote normal function in about four months. And the reality is, is it took, it took closer to a year to really feel strong again. And then it took subsequent years to figure out how my body was gonna work with these new movement patterns. Lesson number two, the body will heal itself with proper training. And I saw this happen on the vascular level and I saw this happen on the neural level and I saw it happen on the muscular level. What I mean by the body will heal itself is when after I had the vein graft, that vein didn't take. So then I had this sort of major highway that had closed down from my venous system. It took time and it took a lot of patience and repetitions for the smaller veins to help bring blood flow back. So I had this residual swelling that would occur. I mean, it, I mean, honestly, for years afterwards, but then, you know, through wearing compression on and off with exertion and from just sort of monitoring the process of it, making sure I wasn't overloading my vascular and lymphatic system was a huge component of the rehab. Also things like getting back to running, it was probably four or five months after surgery where I was running several miles again. And that jostling through the shoulder took, a lot, took time for me to understand how to stabilize my body so I wasn't having as much up and down sort of movement through the right shoulder. As that process got stronger, I saw the body, the muscles adapt in the area to then support my body differently. Lastly, I remember when in the first few months after surgery when I was resuming dumbbell bench press and as my shoulder blades would sit back onto the bench, this one here I could tell was not holding position. So I could feel my right shoulder blade winging out and, and avoiding the position of stabilizing the scapula which helps stabilize the shoulder position. Again, those things, they're all components of rehab and 
becoming aware of of when the onset of symptoms happen, happens, what's happening in your body and what you're experiencing is gonna be a huge part of getting out of the rehab process and sort of getting out of the pain cycle of thoracic outlet syndrome. So the body will heal itself and the body will adapt and respond, but it will take time. Lesson number three, you must gradually strengthen and mobilize the shoulder. Gradual is the key word here. In, a, in physical therapy, there's a, a saying that says stability before mobility, meaning you need to be able to stabilize and hold every position of the shoulder before you can sort of freely move through that range of motion. So for me, what that looked like is isometric positions here. We're learning how to just to hold different positions in a plank or with, with bands to stabilize the rotator cuff, then gradually taking that through range of motion and then taking that through bigger and bigger ranges of motion. And you need to do that for all the different scapular muscles. So the serratus anterior and the traps, which really help lock the shoulder back into position. Understanding how to engage those muscles is gonna be the foundation of getting back to many different shoulder movements. But this idea that we need to gradually strengthen it. So finding, finding the most challenging position that you can tolerate without compensation is the beginning position. And so I'll say that again, it's the, the most challenging position that your body can do without compensation. That often is gonna be maybe two or three steps lower than where you wanna begin. And so for me, that would be doing forearm planks on my knees where I can really lock into the shoulder position, hold the core without things cheating out or without my upper trap taking on all the tension, and then working from a forearm plank to a full plank, to a straight arm plank, to then being eventually adding weights through a range of motion. But it's gonna be gradual and you need to remember the principle of stability before mobility, meaning understanding how to stabilize each position and each movement of the shoulder before we add a range of motion or add more strength onto those ranges of motion. So the body will heal itself with with gradual strengthening and gradual mobility of the shoulder. Lesson number four, no one else is going to understand what you're going through with the exception of maybe some other people who had thoracic outlet syndrome in a first rib resection or, or me who, who's had that experience and is a physical therapist, but only a few people will really understand the challenges that come with getting with the rehab process of thoracic outlet syndrome. Because of that, it can be a frustrating process at times because there's this notion that after surgery, after a few months after surgery, everything's back to normal. I remember going to my follow-up visits and I would have to complete like 15 pages of paperwork every time. And that's because I was part of a big research study that I didn't really understand at the time. But when they're doing so much research on an area, it means that we're still exploring the topic and we're still figuring out what's the best protocol, the best plan of care for patients. What, does, what are the symptoms that are following with someone with thoracic outlet syndrome? So no one's gonna understand what you're going through, which means that you have to have confidence in yourself and you have to have confidence in the process. And most importantly, you need to become aware of your the own mind-body connection. So, what activities aggravate your symptoms? What activities alleviate your symptoms? Uh, what's the onset before symptoms arise afterwards? Um, it's complex and it's also very self-reflective. So if you're willing to put in the time to understand those things, I think you're gonna have a very good outcome, but it's gonna be frustrating because other people are gonna expect that you're quote better by now but that process is gonna take a long time and it's gonna take a lot of self-reflection. So no one's gonna fully really understand what you're going through. So that means you need to take control or take power over your own situation because really you're gonna be the, the one that gets you back to full function and you're gonna be the one experiencing the symptoms. So that means you need to be the one that's taking control or taking charge of your health. In summary, you need to be patient and you need to make rehab of your thoracic outlet syndrome a top priority in your life. And what that means is you might have to take a step back from some other things temporarily. This area of the body has so much complexity to it because of all the nerves and blood vessels and how much mobility the shoulder naturally requires 
So you need to make rehab a priority. And if not, you're likely gonna have some chronic or lingering symptoms that will leave you questioning later on. You need to be patient because if you're, if you're expecting this to be a quick and easy rehab process, you're also gonna get frustrated and you're gonna be blaming someone else for the problem. So uh, my summary points here are be patient, gradually progress the rehab process, expect some up and down, some setbacks as you go through the process. And then you, there's really no other option than you can't, you can't give up on this area. So you need to sort of respect the healing process, uh, use resources that are out there and available for you, and then do your best to maintain confidence, to maintain some self-reflection on what is causing different symptoms. And then ultimately, you need to be the one that's taking control of your health.